Hi, I'm Rajneesh. And I'm Bridget. Welcome to Terra Science, the podcast where reality matters. I'm really excited uh, to have our guest uh, Sue Blackmore with us today, and uh, we are going to talk about the heart problem, uh, consciousness, and who else uh, than Sue to dig into this very interesting issue of what makes us alive or aware? Uh, who are we? And so before really, uh, but don't have to explain the question. I think it's really simple. Most people have thought about it. So let's start with welcoming Sue to our podcast. Welcome, Sue. Thank you very much. But no, it's not simple. And now that's two completely different questions. <laughs> the question about life, why we're alive, is basically resolved. We know how we evolved and how we got here and what how life began. And, yep. you know, it, it seemed absolutely impossible 100 years ago, certainly 150 years ago, it seemed impossible. Now it's kind of resolved. The details have been blocked right. by now. But well, uh, well, what I meant was... Uh, Consciousness yes. and what I meant was, what is life? Yes, so they are separate, and you know the question is, what what is life? Uh, what 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 does being alive mean? And and you're right, you know, we, we know how we got here. And, and for making an organism that functions and that evolves and adapts to its environment yeah. and passes on things, all of that is manageable. But awareness, yes. that's not at all. So I don't, nope. I, I, I'm, all <laughs> right. I'm saying really is I don't want to get sucked down the what is life question because no, no, sure. I'm, I'm not the expert on it. Um, and it's not, yes. it's not the same dif- level of difficulty at this point in the 21st century. We are so I, I completely agree. Compre- yes, I completely agree. Uh, being aware, how, how, how are we aware? What is awareness? But before we uh, jump into that, uh, I would love Sorry, to hear uh, just a little bit of your yeah, no, I'd love to hear a little bit of your path, you know, how how you uh, uh, you uh, started thinking about this. And then, um, you know, you're at you were at a point where you wrote books and giving talks. And clearly, I appreciate your understanding of awareness and consciousness. So before we uh, get into that topic, tell us how you got into it. Well, there are really two threads of my whole life as far as consciousness is concerned. One is the external, the scientific, the academic, the writing, the reading, studying. The other is the internal, well, it never is really because it relates to other people, Zen training, which I've been doing for more than 40 years, and just a kind of obsession with the nature of mind, dreams. I spend a lot of time on the edge of sleep, um, playing around with different states of consciousness using psychedelics and other drugs and so on and so on. So there's the, the internal and the external. How they began, well, I think even as a kid, I was extremely scientifically minded. I just wanted, I, you know, one of those really annoying kids who just asks questions all the time and wants to know the answers. I can remember very young being really worried about heat. What is heat? Because I couldn't understand how it moves from, you know. So that's the kind of mind I've always had. But when I went up to Oxford, um, when I was... Um, 19 in 1970 and um, I, uh, I I went to read physiology and psychology for my degree and um, I just joined lots of societies as you do you know go to Freshers, Freshers Fair and so on right. and I joined among other things the Psychical Research Society and this turned out there was only one member left from the previous year so and, and I rather fancied him he had long 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 curly hair and you know this was sort of hippie you know, you know. And he was great. So I agreed to start up with him and I ran that society. He got he got sent down and I remained running this society for the whole three years that I was there. <coughs> Excuse me. Hope you can cut that. <coughs> yeah. I'll have a good talk and then we'll do it again. <coughs> right. Um so I ran the Psychic Research Society in, in, in the university all the time I was there. And we used to do crazy things like, well, not crazy exactly, but, you know, we had mediums and spiritualists and psychics and what have you come to speak to us and psychical researchers uh, doing research. And we did Ouija board sessions. And it was one night when we'd been doing Ouija for ages. And I was really exhausted, you know, 
I was so loved it there. For the first time in my life, I was really enjoying myself, staying up too late, getting up for nine o'clock lectures, and then spending hours on the Ouija board, you know. And it does make your sense of where your arm is go a bit funny, which is very significant uh, to what happened. So later on, I was in a friend's room smoking some dope, and uh, not very much, though, because uh, I, I was so tired, I was feeling a bit weird. And I was sat on the floor going down a tunnel towards a bright light. This is long before the term near-death experience was um, coined. And I hadn't a clue what's going on. And, but I was talking. My friend kept saying, you know, are you all right? Do you want some coffee? I was like, I couldn't speak. And as I went down this tunnel and he started talking to me, I kind of flipped and I was on the scene looking down. Well, that's how it seemed to me. And this was the beginning of a two hours of an extraordinary experience, which ended up with a classic mystical experience of, of unity, of non-duality, of no self. Um, I went through, actually, mm -hmm. I think, having subsequently learned to practice the jhanas, these series of altered states you can induce by concentration, I think I went through three of the yeah. jhanas, uh, actually, probably to the fifth, um, just spontaneously, which makes me think that there's something about human brains and the way they work, that these kinds of states can be uh, released under the right circumstances. Goodness knows why that happened to me then. But, you see, I can understand now, I can kind of forgive myself but um, for being so dim, but I, I do understand why. I just jumped to the conclusion that this proved life after death, the spirit or the soul or the astral body. I was quite sure that consciousness could exist outside of the body. I was quite sure that this meant that telepathy and clairvoyance and psychokinesis and precognition, all the things that uh, parapsychology deals with, all must be true. And I got, ah, now, can you imagine this? Um, I like, uh -huh. I'm going to prove to all those closed minded scientists that they're wrong and there's more, you know, all that stuff. So that was how I, how I um, went from there. And I turned down a, a very sensible um, PhD place at a really good university in order to find a way to do parapsychology myself, which I did. And the story of that was that after five years or so of, of experimental work, and always chasing of oh, this doesn't work so I'll try this, this doesn't work so I'll try that, uh, eventually changing my mind big time and deciding that it's all a load of posh. <laughs> Just because of the evidence, you know? Yes. <laughs> I, you know, so, I really, so, really, really, so, so really now... wanted a theory to the one that would change the world, yeah. you know, and it, it wasn't, it was wrong. <laughs> so so now, now um, um... You, you you think that the uh, you know out of body experience uh, uh, with, with your own experience as well, uh, it is uh, generated in the mind. Is that that's the conclusion that you drew? Yeah, but you've got to be very careful research. with words like generate. Um, we don't. Yeah. You know, the hard problem you mentioned the hard problem at the start. The hard problem is right. normally expressed certainly by Dave Chalmers as uh, how yeah. the physical brain gives rise to subjective experience, which immediately makes puts you into a kind of dualism because you've got this one thing and it gives yeah. rise to the other thing. And when you say generates, you've got kind of the same problem. Um, right. Yes. It's very hard to express these so, things yeah, clearly. What I would say right, instead right, is, that, I, I is that we can now, with the neuroscience we have now, we can understand exactly why people have out-of-body experiences, which part of the brain is involved, mm -hmm. why it's involved, what kind of conditions can set it off. And it fits extremely well with the evidence. But of course, if you go and read all the books, you know, my books on, on out-of-body experiences don't sell very well. It's all the ones that this proves life after death that do. And they reuse the same stories again and again and again. And all of them have been debunked. And oh, it's... I, well, so, many, so that, 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 that's, that's, that's where... That, that, Yes, and, and that's where we will we will talk about uh, you know focus on. But uh, before we get into that, I was there at the Science of Consciousness, and after ten years, uh, you were reunited uh, on the stage with uh, Deepak Chopra, who uh, I also collaborate with uh, on other uh, projects, uh, and it was uh, quite fascinating uh, because uh, there was a discussion, and I, I heard you say several times that I agree with you, Deepak. So, so can you uh, tell us what, what parts were you agreeing with and what, what you think is the key difference or differences between how you think of consciousness and how Deepak may describe it? I had dinner with Deepak the night before. I always have got on really well with him. And um, there was a lot of things I agree with him about. 
Um, but I suppose the, 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 the most important things I agree about, it, the methods for meditation that he teaches are sound, good methods. He, he does wonderful guided meditations. The way he talks about the mind, the way it changes during meditation, the way it relates to your everyday life, all of these kinds of things, I'm absolutely with him. Uh, and also some of the ideas about the nature of self. But he has a theory, he would say it was, that um, uh, consciousness first, everything is consciousness, and matter doesn't exist. Yes. Now, what can you do with that? You can't do anything with that idea. It takes you absolutely nowhere. <laughs> if you think about the basic philosophical problem, on one end you've got materialism, so everything is matter, and all we need to do is understand the brain, and then we'll solve the hard problem, and you know we'll we'll understand consciousness. But at the moment we can't because matter doesn't, at the moment, uh, solve the problem. Or you go the opposite end, idealism, and you say, well, it's all mind. But then, how come there appears to be matter? It's not just a question of, you know, is it really neutrons and protons and electrons and whatever? They're names that we've given to findings done with machinery and, and so on. Um, I'm not talking about anything like that, just the very, very basic things. You and I right now can agree that I'm hitting the top of my head and I can feel it and you can see it. You can probably hear it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we agree. What is it then that makes agreement possible? What is it then that makes it possible to build a house and live in it? I mean, just saying it's all mine doesn't give you any answers at all. And just as well, saying so, it's all mine yes. doesn't help solve the problem of consciousness. Yes. Deepak is just sticking to an impossible position. And if you challenge him on it, as I did, he just slithers off and talks about something else, which is very frustrating because when I'm on my own with him, I, you know, I seem to get on fine. We're up on there in the audience and it's all slither, slither, wriggle, wriggle. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think I think uh, I, I was there, and I, I gathered uh, that that difference, uh, and I felt very strongly a lot of it has to do with how we use the word consciousness. Well, yeah. would you would you agree, or I'm sure you thought of this as well that Deepak uses the word consciousness perhaps slightly differently than than maybe how you may use it, uh, because if, when Deepak mentions consciousness, he's thinking uh, uh, to to give you an, give an example. Uh, if you think about stem cells, in our current body, uh, there are stem cells, but they are in bone marrow, and you know, but but the original stem cells uh, from the original embryo, they are nowhere there. So perhaps what what I think when Deepak is saying consciousness, he's meaning something where the matter started, or or that's why he says consciousness comes before matter. So there was some information that led to the production of matter, matter, but then uh, what that stage was is no longer the same in the in the form of matter that that we experience what but do you think of that what what does it mean there's there's mind first what is it and it, he's giving powers to consciousness i don't think i can say that he and i have a different view of what the word means and that that might resolve some of our problems. I don't think so. I think we're, we're getting right. at the same thing. We're mm -hmm. getting at what is it like to be me? I'm sitting here now with pictures of you two in front of me. Yeah. You can see birds over there and the, the trees outside blowing in the wind. This is my right. ongoing now experience. This is what it is that we call being conscious. Um, so right. how, does, how does his... I don't think he sees it in a, in a different way at all. But if he says this about stem cells, well... Explain that. Give, give any kind of. Um, well, no. So I, I, I'm saying that. Yeah, I, I'm saying that. I, I don't want to, uh, you know, um, say that uh, Deepak would say that. But uh, I, I, I'm saying. Uh, so I'm sort of, I think, in between you and Deepak, uh, because on one end, uh, you know, Deepak's point of view is consciousness is everything, and and you're saying that consciousness is in, is in, again, it's words. Uh, I, you know, it's not very easy to express. But you're saying that consciousness is our experience and it doesn't have oh, to be something outside, uh, right? Uh, it, it, it's, you, you don't believe that it is something outside of the body. Would you, would, no, would you say that? No, not at all. No? Um, okay. He is saying that everything is consciousness. Now, 
in yes. a way, that's another of the things I agree with him about. In this sense, mm -hmm. everything that I can know comes about in experience. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that Deepak and I agree that, you know, what we're talking about is subjective experience, what it's like to be me, you know, the whole bat right. stuff and all that, what it's like to yeah. be experiencing yeah. a world. I don't think we disagree about, about that at all. But right. um, I think we also agree um, that what else is there? You know, there's experience. I can pick up these <laughs> glasses and, uh, you know, I can think that there are actual physical glasses here, but all I have is this experience of picking them up. I can go and get a weighing scale and I can weigh this little thing here and see what it weighs. Mm -hmm. And I can say, ah, that weighs 15 grams. You know, the... But it's all my experience. So in a sense, he's mm -hmm. absolutely right, I think, and we completely agree. That's all we have. And the same with physicists doing their right. experiments and sending rockets and whatever. So we don't disagree about that. But you mentioned the stem cell thing. And this made me think about yeah. the, the many, many claims he makes about the power of consciousness mm -hmm. to affect the body and to affect aging, to keep you living forever and ever. And all these completely batty claims. Now, they're not just batty because, honestly, we're not going to live forever, and nor is he, and I'd like to come back to that later. Um, but what, what bothers me is, you didn't say this, but he says this about consciousness. I say consciousness is an illusion. And the reason I'm saying that is because we just have the wrong idea about it, and I think he has the wrong idea about it. He treats consciousness, even though this doesn't, doesn't fit with what we've been talking about his ideas so far, in addition, he says, consciousness can have all these effects on the telomeres and it can lengthen your life and it can affect your genes and all kinds of stuff. And, and the stem cells can be affected by consciousness and so on. That is a dualist position in which consciousness is something separate from, you know, the, the telomeres, the, the, the stem cells and affects them. Now, he claims he's not a dualist. Mm -hmm. And he's talking in non-duality terms a lot of the time, particularly in his meditation teaching. It's all non-duality. It's all oneness. Um, and yet he comes with these very, very popular ideas that sell books that you can use your consciousness to live longer, to live better and all that kind of stuff. It's complete non sequitur from the rest of his ideas, but it sells books. I think based on people's experiences, there are many people who will agree with you and many people who, of course, agree with Deepak. And I'm a scientist and I'm a plant scientist uh, and I've been exploring consciousness um, at some certain levels with experiments. And uh, uh, I've come up with, with my own theory, which I think uh, somehow uh, is in the middle. And this is why I wanted to have a discussion with you. I think I can I can I, I cannot say whether what I'm going to say now Deepak would agree with or not, but I think I can understand what Deepak is saying and what you're saying, that both of you are correct. And when I say that, uh, what I mean is, you know, Deepak comes from the Vedic, the Indian traditional uh, knowledge uh, of consciousness, and and I know I mean uh, one of your books is on Zen as well, uh, so so uh, you you have you have thought about the state of mind or becoming self-aware and you know achieving those things so um, in my point of view i think consciousness is a process the word consciousness the way i think of it just like photosynthesis is a process i think there is information like you just said if if information is fundamental and if there is information in every single pixel of space time there is space time let's say planck's length is the shortest space time there uh, there can be and if it carries if it carries some information that has the properties of a stem cell which can it can take any form so in that sense that information is prerequisite for any form living or non-living to be formed and so i think that's where deepak is is saying that that maybe perhaps again he's not here so i can't uh, say whether he agrees with this or not, but perhaps that information in that pixel of space-time is what he refers to as consciousness. And then once it takes a form, it, it still has that information, but it gets more and more restricted uh, by the properties and characteristics of the shape it takes. So, so actually, in the more free form, it is more capable 
of interaction with the environment of its own. But as it takes a certain form, it has memories, it's restricted by many things. And so then the experience of consciousness is simply our intercorrelation or interaction with the extrinsic free information that we face every moment as we move forward in time uh, in comparison to what's inside us. <laughs> so well, just, I don't know if I'm that just... ties things together or not. Well, it doesn't touch it. It doesn't touch it at all. I mean, I am now okay. looking at an enormous plant that towers over the screen that I'm looking at, you know, and it's got these wonderful wiggly, squiggly yep. green leaves hanging down. This experience is an right. emotional right. experience. It's color. It's it, it's it's spatial. <laughs> now, we can understand how and do understand a great deal about how that perception is built up. We know right. which parts of the brain are involved in the color perception, and we can look at the information flowing through the visual system in sending information elsewhere and so on. Where does the greenness of green, this unique experience of mind come from? This is the hard problem as it's traditionally stated. Yes. And nothing you have said remotely helps it. You just suddenly... No, no, because we don't... Yes, you, I agree. Experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know... It, it, yeah, no, I agree. I, I think, I think the, the qualia, you know, what we call qualia or the quality that we experience of, of things around us, uh, those are... Uh, I think that's sort of what Deepak means is like an illusion because we create each person may have a different we don't ah. know this but each person may look at color you know differently in their may build that up differently so because the color is based on our own perception of the of things around us and how it makes us feel may have to do with memories and so so it's it's sort of like a build up of layers and we don't really understand even scientifically how exactly that works so so you're right it doesn't explain that because <clears throat> we are far from understanding that and it remains a hard problem <laughs> i gave a term to this smallest uh, piece of space time with information i call it spot on so every 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 ma every matter or non matter is made of many 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 spot ons including a photon will have spot ons yeah. and and where does experience come into this so spot ons <laughs> like atoms make molecule of anyway no I, I, yeah i'd like to hear your thoughts on this this is what we're having so i i'm not saying that i've solved the problem i, I but uh, you know i i was thinking about this that perhaps that that there is some information that's what maybe i think deepak thinks because this also aligns with the vedantic or zen you know so if if spotons carry this very pure information and each body has a molecule of these spotons. I call it spoticule. So each form will have a spoticule or space, empty space. And that empty space can have properties just like matter has properties. And so the experience is our own biochemical reaction or our perception and reaction to whatever is around us. But based on the ability to do this is provided by this information. But we don't know what this information is, so I'm making all of this up anyway. <laughs> and you're not touching on the... You know, I, I think the whole concept of qualia is deeply problematic um, anyway, so I don't really like to it use is. the word. Uh, yeah. It is. I am not. You're right. Uh, no, it, that's fine. We agree. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just yeah. stick with qualities. I mean, the qualities of experience, what it is yeah. like. I mean, thank goodness for Nagel's what is it like uh -huh. to be a bat, because that's what I come back to again and again. If there is something it is like to be a bat... That's what we mean by being conscious. And is there something it's like to be me? Well, in certain kinds of deep meditation, I would say no. There is no longer. There is no sense mm -hmm. of what it's like to be me. If there is any experience, it's not experience in space or time, although things are happening. I mean, this doesn't sound sensical, but, you know, this is a, a, a an experience that's familiar to many people who, who do a lot of meditation. Um, but in our ordinary state dealing with the world, here are these experiences of color and taste and smell and everything else. You mm -hmm. can talk all you like about information, but you're just still on the, the side um, of, uh, of matter, you know. It's, it's really, really frustrating. Now, in the midst of that, what I really want to pick up is in the midst of that, you said something about illusion. And you used the term yeah. illusion completely differently from me. I'd like to spell this out because I think it's important. Sure. The way you were using yep. the word illusion, if I understood you correctly, was something like this. Oh, well, if someone else looked at that tree, they'd see it in a different way. And we can't know whether their green is the same as my green and, and so on and so on. So you were using the word illusion in, in one of its traditional senses. 
which mm -hmm. is like visual yeah. illusions. When you look at something mm -hmm. and it appears to be a square or an animal yes. or whatever, and it isn't, uh, actually out there is something mm -hmm. different. That is not at all what I mean when I say that consciousness is an illusion. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be more different. Yeah, no, I, I, know, I understand this, that, yes. yes. Getting into trouble with this years ago um, and being yeah. told that, oh, you Sue Blackmore, you're saying consciousness doesn't exist. <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm saying it's an illusion. You know, wake up, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. So what do I do to resolve this? I got down my dictionary off the shelf. In fact, I can see it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, no, you're right. Uh, the way I use the word was only one aspect of its use. But when someone yeah. says consciousness is an illusion is a totally different meaning, which means that, uh, you know, it's an illusion. What we experience, we, we are not, it's not reality. It's an illusion. No. Um, and, and well, you, you know, well, m m many many people say that uh, you know our experience is not real. The reality is different. You know, there are scientists. Yes, uh, and that's who also say that. I'm not. not what right. I'm saying absolutely not. Okay. Okay. So going okay. back to what I was uh, what I was telling the story. Right. So I went and got a dictionary, and in several uh -huh. dictionaries and online dictionaries, an illusion is something that is not what it seems to be, right? It's right. not okay. that there isn't right. the world, or it's not that I'm seeing the world differently. It, when it comes to consciousness, right. I'm saying, yeah, you can have a visual illusion about something, but if you have an illusion about consciousness, the problem is we think of consciousness as being some kind of power or energy or force, something that we can use, something that is different from matter, right. that can affect matter or be created right. by matter or yep. arises from matter, as in the hard problem. Right. All of that right. is an illusion. In other words, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. That's all I'm saying. Because if you think okay. about it that way, yeah. the traditional way, you hit the hard problem and you can't solve it. Many people would say some think it's soluble, but many, like myself, think it's insoluble. And we're never going to sol solve it until we pull apart right, right, the false right. ideas we have about our own minds. Now, I will take a kind of panpsychist view where yeah. we can go off into that if you want or, or not. But something which gives us a non-dual way of thinking about experience, but it means you have to make massive changes to a lot of other ideas you have. But let's at least be quick, clear about you're using the word illusion in a yes. perfectly yeah. legitimate way that is different from the way I am applying it to consciousness. And that, I think, might help people to yes. understand um, that those... Right. No, and, and, I, and I appreciate appreciate that. That, that. That's a very different way of uh, saying uh, thinking of consciousness and relationship, its relationship to what illusion uh, is. And, and you're right, it's not what scientists are talking about, that our experience is an illusion. We're talking about the three different uh, experiences or types that you described what consciousness can be, whether it, it is a result or a precursor or the heart problem that we can understand. Uh, all of that is an illusion. So uh, the, 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 that that's having said that, uh, is it possible that consciousness is if I say that, you know, following that consciousness is an experience, is it possible that it is a process, just like of photosynthesis course. is yeah. a process it and photosynthesis, a process. it is a process, right? So a photosynthesis takes information. I, as a photobiologist, I think of light as information. When a plant sees light, it, um, it carries information about direction, duration, color, intensity, all of this information, the plant is able to capture and process it and then respond to it. So if consciousness is a similar process that, that we have, maybe plants have it too. Uh, you, you said, what is it like to be a bat? What is it, what is it like to be a pea plant? Uh, I'm not saying that plants are conscious. I want to be clear I, because we don't know anything about that. Uh, but if it is a process consciousness itself, that means there, there must be some information just like light is information Perhaps we don't know what that what that information is, but we are interacting with it, and we have receptors, or we perceive continuously that information, process it, and then respond to it based on our own makeup. In all of this, you hit a problem about information uh, that I would describe this way: our okay. bodies. I mean, if you're talking about a plant, let's say the same plant I'm looking at mm -hmm. here, you know, I look at that with yeah. wonder and I think. <clears throat> You know, it's, I've had it for, it's been in the family for, for 40 years um, and it's grown enormously. And 
it responds to the, the, the time of year, uh, where the light is, I have to be careful where to keep it, and it, you know, it changes when it's not watered, and you know, as you say, we can't know what it's experiencing, if anything. But let's turn to humans. Um, you talked about information. Well, this is what the science does, what neuroscience does, what physiology does, what chemistry does. We, we know so much about the information. I mean, there are mm -hmm. decisions being made all the time in the mm -hmm. cortex that I, this supposedly conscious me, has absolutely no idea about. You just mm -hmm. are throwing yourself into, into this massive problem that why is there uh, some things that seem to be conscious that I am conscious of and all this massive stuff, which we understand pretty well scientifically, although there's loads more to learn, of course, um, which I am not conscious of. And you add to that when you really do a lot of meditation and you get in uh, or, or take psychedelics or and using them properly, not messing about with them, um, you know, you come into different states in which it's not like that. But for the normal, the normal time of consciousness that we're trying to explain is this kind of narrow bit of me. I'm supposed to be conscious of certain things. I can see this red on the desk. I can see this apple that I was eating before we began. Um, you know, um, what's going on here? Now, when you look into a brain and you see all the neurons firing and also the rest of the, the body, but I mean, the, the, the rest of the nervous system, all these neurons firing, getting on with their brilliant jobs. And Bridget, as you said about perception, that's all part of it. This is all information flows. They're all processes. Why should there be this extra thing, though what it's like to be me, when the me, well, we know neuroscientifically, the me is a construct the brain makes, centered on the temporoparietal mm -hmm. junction, long and short connections to all sorts of other places that builds up this sense of the body and of me in it and all of that. Um, why is this problem of consciousness that I am experiencing that green now? How, why should that be different? All of those neurons firing, so, the same kind of stuff happening on. You can't look in a brain and say, those are the conscious neurons and those are not, or that process going. No, no, you're right. Yeah. Or not. You're right. So, it no, so I think, I think per, 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 well, it, well, well, one way to explain that is if we, let's say we go back to the very first cell, uh, you know, at least on this planet, we don't know if there is other life, some other, uh, somewhere else, but let's say the very first cell, it became, when it, let's say it became conscious. Let's, you know, just for argument, let's say it was a rock or it was a cell that was not living. Then that's why I, I was stopped bringing life into it as well. The difference between non-living and living, perhaps, again, this is, you know, just to think about it, is that the non-living uh, matter is subjected to its environment. Whatever is going to happen, it's, it's it's going to be subjected to it. All of a sudden, there was a change where a living cell is now responsive to its environment. So somehow, chemistry, biochemistry, uh, uh, you know, chemistry became biochemistry. Biochemistry became part of the living organism, let's say a cell, and now it's responding to the environment. And what its experience of consciousness was, I would say, you know, very limited. But slowly through evolution, Actually, I, I heard your talk. You were talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, evolution in, in one of the discussions, and you broke it down into three parts. That was, a, I think, it was your TED talk. One of the earlier TED talks it was very interesting, uh, and I really enjoyed that. But in evolution, um, this this process evolved, and plants don't have a neuronal network, but humans do. And so, uh, you know, we our experience of consciousness perhaps is totally different from what a plant might be experiencing or a bat. But it's a process of evolution. So we, we've developed better tools to interact with the environment than from, from the very first cell. And we know that the plant and animal cells, you know, uh, split apart in the branch of evolution. Uh, they used to be one because they both have mitochondria, which, uh, you know, are both in plants and animals. So there was a cell that had mitochondria Later on, chloroplast became part of plants, whereas animals didn't acquire that. So, so to uh, to uh, to answer what you were saying again, this is just my thought: that your experience of knowing that there's an apple, knowing that there's a plant, is your interaction, your uh, visualization, and uh, interpretation of what you're seeing and how you interpret it, and that's the qualia, which is again, you know, if it's a process. You're interacting with information from the environment using tools of perception and signal transduction of chemicals, but then that doesn't still explain why you are or you or I am conscious or we are conscious. 
Yeah. It's just suggests it that it just suggests no, it doesn't. It just suggests uh, it just starts to open up the possibility that there is something extrinsic that we interact with. Just like in photosynthesis, there is light that's ah. extrinsic. So, so right, it's just something outside that we're interacting with uh, to ex to have this experience. I see where you're going now. But at the very beginning of what you were explaining there, you you made a dualist leap from the very beginning. You said this this rock might get consciousness as though consciousness is some kind of separate thing. Now, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I didn't mean that way. Yeah. No, well, but it's so easy to say that kind of thing because it's it very, is. very it difficult is, yes. to do away with it. Yes. I, I mean, again, I mentioned panpsychism. Right. I don't have a fully worked out yeah. panpsychic view, but I'm tempted into that because if, if you get a, if you have to get away from saying, oh, there's this extra thing, um, then what are you going to do? Where I'm going to go with it is yeah. to say, I, all of what you do leads into the same problem I tried to explain before, that why should there be this sense of me inside and only me mm -hmm. looking out through the eyes is the, is the conscious thing and everything else that's going on. I mean, all the time, my hands are waving around. I'm sitting upright in my seat and moving when I need to, completely without mm -hmm. noticing it in the bit that you might call me. It's all neurons. It's all the same stuff. Why this illusion comes about that so I so <laughs> so I so again you know this is more of a theoretical I, I I these are these are not easy experiments to do but I I can add something to that so like I mentioned if if there is if there's information in every space time which I call spot on then I I'll take my example my form has many many spot ons and those spot ons have information and accumulation of all that spot ons is a spoticule. So Raj has a Raj sporticule and uh, Sue has a Sue sporticule and Bridget has a Bridget sporticule. So what my sporticule is completely distinct from anyone else's sporticule because ever since I was a little baby, I started to gather more space time as, as, as my body grew. And my uh, experience of everything that I did in my life left a mark, left a memory. And that memory is part of the sporticule. And so so what, my, what I recognize myself as is this particle which is space-time information, which is distinct from matter, and I I don't believe in duality. Uh, that's not the duality. I think I think uh, duality uh, is not it cannot is not invoked here. What what I mean is that space-time has the property. It's just it's one, and then it grows. It's bud budding out uh, different like our cells and skin comes out, and so it's just one thing, and this one thing is. Uh, interacting with the same one thing that's outside but the one thing that's interacting has its own characteristics built, built, built from genetics and memory and everything so my sporticule the original information is is the same as the outside so with meditation self-realization is becoming more and more aware or becoming more connected to that pure form of information that is outside but then our sporticule is responsible for our experience so uh, whatever you experience or i experience is slightly different um it's based on our uh accumulation of of our experiences what did you say there about about meditation or about a, a change in consciousness i'm sorry so, did you come i, I can't so, remember so about how experiencing Okay, I, I will I will I will repeat that part. So so experiencing a materialistic world, you know, we 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 our bodies are built for survival, and so experiencing that we have to interact and we have likes and dislikes and all of these things. But what I said about meditation was, um, when when one is meditating, they are uh, it's, they are experiencing a little bit of distance from the material experiences as much they're they're seeking that distance and as you become more and more distant distanced from the materialistic experiences or the needs or desires or things like that uh, you start to open up a little bit more to that uh, more of an awareness of this information that is outside and being more connected so self-realization okay. Self-realization, that was the word I was trying to get at. So self-realization for you is actually grasping something new. It's actually relating to some kind of information. Um, 
and you're trying to theorize what that information might be and how this might work. To me, self-realization, but it's an odd word here because the self as it normally is goes away in states that we call self-realization. And where does it go to? You're, you're, you're implying that there's something gained, but at least in the tradition that I've trained in for a very long time, there's nothing gained. It's all about letting go. Well, it's I all about so I I, I will I will also say it, it's about yes, it's about no, I, letting go of the self that I thought I was, and where does it go then? Yes, it doesn't go to somewhere else. No, no, I I agree. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I, I also, I was in Brazil in 2019 and I uh, did uh, ayahuasca ceremonies and uh, I, that was my very first experience of what you were describing uh, when we started. So I, I think in self-realization, I didn't feel like I lost something. I felt like I dissolved into something. Uh, and yes, so into I, what? I, I, Right? I, I, I was in, into to, this... Uh, you, you interrupted when I was really trying to explain something. Oh, sorry difference okay. between what you were saying about going to something and the sort of experience where it's gone the obsessions are gone the concept of self is gone but where has it gone it hasn't gone to anywhere it's more as though there is the nothingness or emptiness or non-being out of which experience mm -hmm. comes and it is with mm -hmm. practice and ayahuasca and other psychedelics can help possible to see that and perhaps that's what you saw but yet you want to yeah. concretize yes. it you want to turn it into something rather than the rather scary mm -hmm. prospect actually there never was me uh, it was all an illusion <laughs> right this nothingness out of which stuff apparently comes okay nothing can be said about it yeah so so that, that, that that's that's the only difference i think i think of whether whether there was, there is something that is you, or whether no, and and this gets into another very uh, very difficult topic. What happens after death? Is there something that is you, and then does that thing that is you uh, survive after death, or does it not? Right. So uh, I mean, I, I don't have any particular opinion on anything because I haven't experienced anything. I have okay. Very opinion on yeah. it you know the illusion of yeah. self which is very powerful i mean i'm right. sitting here feeling as though i'm right. inside looking, i mean actually not as dissolved enough these years but you know uh more or less yeah. i'm sitting in here looking at you this this idea that that i and i am responsible for the things that i do in a very peculiar way that it's the little me inside that's yep. responsible when really it's actually this whole physical being that is responsible for things including all its background and its its experiences and all of that um sorry I'll, I'll i'll leave it there yeah no 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 it's true that no that that is true it is i agree with you it everything everything that this this body or this form does is responsible for it there is no one else that can There's take no that responsibility not because of this little invented me inside here that, that he's doing no no no, no no so who yeah. would this be who was this being to like yes thank you bridget who would who would this be who could possibly survive after death this illusory self we can nope. see how it's constructed in the brain it's a massive of it's a process an ongoing process through life in which this story uh, story about a self that doesn't really exist is built up and built yeah, up and built yeah. up and it leads leads to craving and guilt and self-hatred and a yep. million of other things now well, how could that possibly survive after death it couldn't no 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 it doesn't i don't think i don't think it does yeah. So, what's your view on life after death? And what what could you think? Would so, survive? so, 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 uh, uh, what? But again, you know, I don't have any uh, any experiment. This is very theoretical. So, I uh, because when I started thinking about spot on and spoticule, so if if we say that there is information that's constricted or restricted by the form that it is in, and then spoticule is the total information of the entire life's experience, it has characteristics. What is possible? If spoticule is the accumulation of space and information uh, that uh, that I accumulated over time, it is it is possible, and I have no experiment designed or anything. I, I'm thinking about this. It is possible that at the time of death there is some little energy, some information that remains. That spoticule remains, maybe not for very long, maybe for a short time, maybe uh, maybe it it. You know, uh, uh, like I think one analogy I, uh, I've, I've heard uh, um, 
that there is this uh, uh, mystic, uh, you know, Sadhguru. I'm sure you've heard of him. <laughs> he 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 describes this part, uh, and I start to think about this. I was thinking about this before, but he describes it as if you know uh, an air bubble. So you have an air bubble, and each person has their own air bubble. Some may have a thinner skin, some may have a th thicker thicker skin. But once the air bubble bursts, the air inside is indistinguishable from from the indistinguishable from the rest of the air. So there was something that was that kept the characteristics of of an individual that then perhaps is released or or remains maintain some characteristics there is just that tiny tiny little possibility but i have i have no uh, i'm already beyond you know from what i can uh, test why would you even why was i there at all in tucson with deepak it was because yeah. 10 years before um I, we had had quite a, a ding dong on the stage uh, mm -hmm. disagreeing with each other i was i suppose um to put it crudely, saying that he was making money out of pretending things. Uh, you know, he's giving wonderful meditation advice, but then he turns it all into money. Um, and, you know, we, we had quite a, a fight there. But in the middle of this, he told me, very, he stood up over me, I mean, very strongly said to me, I follow the Vedic way. And uh, it, the, the life should be in the first quarter of your life you get educated and grow up the next one uh, you, you you know you go on until the last phase of life you go away at the age of 75 roughly the last quarter of life to seek enlightenment or transcendence mm -hmm. this is what he told mm -hmm. me 10 years ago well he was 65 then um, and so I thought 10 years later I would like to find out whether Deepak is actually giving it all up and going away to seek enlightenment and this is why um, the Tucson conference organized for us to have this lovely okay. evening event and, and to talk about it. And so we did talk about it. And it is. I can, I can, I can add a little. Yeah, I can add a little bit there. Um, so I've, I've known Deepak. I've been involved with the Chopra Foundation. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the way I was brought in was to worry about or think about planetary health, especially during the pandemic. Deepak was. Uh, working, uh, trying to put together uh, ideas uh, to think about microbiomes, and so he's 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 been putting a lot of effort, and you know, putting getting people together to uh, think of solutions for um, the health of the planet. And um, you know, I, I I don't know whether that that equates to him taking the the quarter, you know, part. Uh, and by the way, the the ten year ago. My, uh, a debate that your discussion that you mentioned is also um, available on YouTube, and I watched it as well. So if anyone wants to watch that, and then this last uh, uh, this year's, but uh, you know, I think so. I I can't speak for Deepak, but I I do appreciate that as well. What you are saying, and that's why you were there, to to see how how is he's approaching. And I know that he he has been trying to take on large global projects, but you know, I I, I can't say more more than that. Uh, well, all I can say is that <laughs> he carries on with this life of a, a mixture of really good advice about meditation and so on, and then uh, medical yeah. claims that are simply not valid, all, this, all these problems, and claims about himself and what his life is about. And at least for now, at nearly 76, he is definitely carrying on with running all these big projects and earning lots of money, and he's, he's written 99 books and wants to get beyond 100 and is this important? I think it is important if you, if you treat him and many others as spiritual leaders leading from within and living a spiritual life. And that's why I found, I was sad to find, not surprised to find mm -hmm. that he is not actually leading the Vedic life that he claimed. Although he may still do so. I mean, it's not fixed at 75. He may do that. But all of what he's teaching, yeah. Well, I mean, do, giving it all up, letting go of self, self-aggrandizement of riches and all of this, letting those things go, and seeing how the world is, and that's what I attempt to do. Uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of us do by practicing, by studying science, by practicing meditation and mindfulness to try and do that. So that was what that was all about, and it was very sad the way yeah. it ended up. Um, 
as people will see if they well i i i will say that that uh, both in your own different ways uh, both of you uh, are very uh, you know expressive and vocal about your thinking and deepak definitely touches many people and has uh, influence on them and you as well with your books and so so both of you have contributed to benefiting and improving people's thinking and thoughts and how they deal with consciousness so i, I would say both of you have contributed um and i hope uh, you know uh, we will have another one of those discussions where it actually is uh, is a is a discussion <laughs> and yeah. and uh, you know it it it, it, it is nice. actually uh, an, i i i would i will i will talk with stuart and maybe uh, if you are open to it maybe we should do a real a real one uh, repeat one um you know uh, because the, the science of consciousness next uh, this, uh, next year it will be in italy and then it will be back in arizona again uh, the year after and uh, so anyway i'll leave that open and i'll be exciting to have you back there as well because these are very important topics and and people like you and deepak who spent a lot of time thinking about these uh people like to hear from you and so that that's that's the key part and this is why we i wanted to have this uh podcast as well well i'm glad you did thank you very much thank you sue bye bye raj the things that motivate me are the beauty of our environment the uniqueness of our planet of course but also the people i've met and the fact that people do want to play a stewardship role welcome to terra science the podcast where reality matters i thought microtubules might be processing information at this basic level here we are another 30 years later you can actually say it i'm going to be a scientist <laughs> so you will be what was fascinating is what emerged from that was also a transformation in their consciousness <laughs> <laughs> If I try to do that, we're going to go down that rabbit hole. Cuz I wrote it for people like you to get a sense of yeah. field biology for women to appreciate the challenges. In that process of detection, that molecule momentarily is bound to us, you know, it becomes part of us. So it's this incredibly intimate encounter that we have with the things of We are consistently asking what's wrong with the student rather than what's wrong with the educational system today. Maybe somebody will be inspired to also go into this field someday too. That would be amazing. Well, I hope so. Welcome to the Terra Science podcast. The podcast where reality matters. My name is Rajneesh. I'm a plant scientist at Carnegie Institution. at Stanford University and an entrepreneur attempting to upgrade our food systems and our planetary footprint for the benefit of earth and humanity. And my name is Bridget. I'm a current graduate student and former vertical farmer and I'm very passionate about public education and increasing access to healthy and nutritious foods. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube under Terra Science or follow the links in the description below to learn more. We'll see you 